Okay, thank you so much for joining The Next Right Thing. I'm Debbie Giorgiani with Adam Bly. Keith is doing such a fine job as our host of Morning Joy, so we're so grateful that we have this very short segment, we believe, because we got a lot to cover. We're talking about boredom today or sloth or acedia or all the the uh, kind of negative, bad things, um, deadly sins that can really cause problems in our in our spiritual life. And Adam and I were talking about this idea of boredom in general, and we deal with it a lot in life coaching. So I wanted to share a couple things about boredom. Boredom is dangerous, in my opinion, and I'll tell you why. Because when you're bored, naturally you probably won't go to another activity that is boring, correct? Because if you're bored, you're not going to you're not going to trade one feeling for a similar feeling. Typically, that vacuum gets filled with an activity that is more enticing, alluring, intense for you, because that's what supposedly takes you out of that bored boredom feeling. That's where it becomes dangerous, because those activities, oftentimes, are not beneficial to your spiritual life. Now, if you're bored and you have the motivation to get up, put your sneakers on and go to the gym and work out for an hour, that's fantastic. Working on getting your body strong and healthy, that's, that's pleasing to God. But oftentimes what happens is when people are bored, especially children, and I used to see this all the time in religious education, Adam, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. When kids are bored, they will naturally gravitate towards things that is destructive or negative or hurtful to themselves or to other people. And that's where it becomes a problem. As adults, same thing happens where you get um, addicted to something and going on the internet. That's why my parents used to always say nothing good happens after 10 o'clock at night because people are bored. There's not much going on. You can't pick up the phone and talk to somebody or even text somebody because maybe they're sleeping. So what happens? People go on the internet and they can get into trouble. Okay. So I kind of set the table for this and set the stage. Why don't you share your thoughts on this? Yeah. So boredom takes a couple of of forms. Um, One I just want to mention up front is kind of like a public service announcement about why it's so important to stay away from drugs is I've done a fair bit of work um, working with people that were addicted to drugs in the prisons. And here's the thing about drugs that make it so difficult. Our normal pleasure chemicals in our brain, the levels of them, if we think of like dopamine and serotonin, those are the ones most of us, most of us have heard of. Well, let's say, you know, the average positive experience in life, like, you know, your football team did a touchdown and they won the game and you you get a rush of happiness and yell and clap. You know, let's say that gets you to four out of 10 on on that scale. And let's see the the birth of your first child is, you know, a 10 out of 10 on the dopamine scale. It's really a a high. It's a, a peak moment in life. The problem with drugs is they artificially push the brain to say a 15 out of 10 on the pleasure level. And then normal pleasurable things in life compared to 15 out of 10 now feel like a 1 out of 10 because you've now said, oh, wait, my scale goes to 15. It doesn't just go to 10. I want to feel higher than, you know, the greatest peak moment in life, I need to get back to that. And now in comparison, the things that used to be great in life feel flat. Okay, but hold on right there, because I want to just make sure we we capture this. So when you expose yourself to these things, you're you're raising the intensity of, of, of what you take in. And so now when you experience something less than that, it automatically is going to register in your brain that this is dull, boring, flat, whatever. So you have to keep, you have to keep um, chasing that high, correct? Yeah. So, so let's say the brain is only designed to go to 10 out of 10 on the pleasure chemicals in your brain as a, as a reinforcer of behavior. Like I eat food and I feel good. And that's mother, mother nature's way of encouraging us to eat and stay alive. Okay. Um, sexual activity, uh, there's great pleasure associated to encourage reproduction from a biological perspective. And let's say the brain is designed to go to 10 out of 10 max on those pleasure chemicals, and that's a normal human lifespan. We take these artificial drugs that push us way beyond that 
into say 15 or 20 out of 10 and we have experiences that our brain was not designed to deal with and our psyche is is saying all of a sudden oh i i didn't know it was possible to feel this good and now in comparison the things that used to seem great because they were an 8 out of 10 well now they're not so great because now i know i can get to 15 or 20 out of 10 and so i don't care about those things anymore i only care about this thing but there's nothing in life that can get you there because the natural body system only goes to 10 out of 10. So no matter what you do, you can't push your body to feel that good because you've artificially manipulated it. And that's why drugs are so dangerous because everything else falls away. And I will do anything to get back to 15 out of 10 because everything else feels incredibly boring and depressing in comparison. Well, let me ask you this question because I just thought of this and, and we didn't even, um, you know, uh, plan this or script this. So I'm just, it's coming to me as you're, as you're speaking on this topic. What about a mystical encounter with God? Because when you talk about this heightened feeling or this intensity or, or going above your normal sense of, of pleasure, there have been many times when I have been in, uh, uh, in church during um, an encounter at mass or in adoration where I have felt an elevated state of, of that pleasure it, to the point where it was like, I feel like I'm in heaven for a moment. Mm -hmm. Did, speak about that a little bit. Yeah. So that's a great point. Um, so, you know, St. John of the Cross talked about this as the unitive state. So there was kind of three, three stages of, of the spiritual life, purgative, illuminative, and unitive. Purgative, stop doing bad. Illuminative, start doing good, leading more and more of a Christian life, a Christ-like life. And then maybe God will come and give you a foretaste of heaven, which he called the unitive state, which is okay. what you're describing, like a, like a, what they would call as divine ecstasy, mm -hmm. not a physical divine ecstasy, ecstasy right. but a divine one. Gotcha. Here's the thing that's so interesting about that is in our culture today, it has now become very popular to instead of pursuing God through r religious practices and, and spirituality over the decades of our life, and maybe God will give us these foretaste moments, these, these moments of elation. Instead of that, the drugs are held out as a shortcut to have that elation. So people say, oh, I'm going to go to South America and take this special brew made by these shaman, and it's guaranteed to give me this God experience on demand by, by taking these drugs uh, or other drugs. There's, you know, some people think that through LSD they can, they can have God encounters and that type of thing. That's the great danger is you can't make a God experience by tweaking the brain. The mm -hmm. brain is affected by God, by a, God, a genuine God experience, a mystical experience. It is affected in a secondary way. It's primarily the soul being affected when there's a mystical encounter with God in some way. And yes, the brain is affected by that. But it's God and then the body and the brain secondarily. When we try to force it the other direction, think about it again. Does God come and reward us harming and poisoning our body to force us into an altered state to try to find God? Is God going to reward that by actually showing up and giving us genuine mystical experience? That doesn't make sense. Right. He doesn't want us to poison our body with drugs. And mm -hmm. so what you end up with are basically self-delusion. You get some elevated state. Um, but it's not God. It's just you forcing the, mach the bio machinery of your brain into this altered state. But that doesn't mean that God has actually shown up in that Present. sense of mm -hmm. a mystical sense. In that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. This is really powerful stuff we're talking about today. Boredom, sloth, acedia. You know, these are, these are things that we encounter on a regular basis. We may not realize these are very serious sins. Uh, which can lead us into um, being severed from from God's um, God's favor and being in that state of grace. We can be we can be uh, quickly go into um, the mortal sin range very quickly with these with these types of 
um, situations that we uh, encounter. So that's why we're addressing it today on the next right thing, so that we can all uh, avoid it and no, be aware that it that it can happen very easily. And what we can do to um, quickly change gears, uh, switch gears, switch our focus, and get back onto a, a strong spiritual solid path. So that's why we're we're addressing this today. Adam, um, we're going to send it back to Keith in about uh, 90 seconds. Any final comments on this portion of of the next right thing? Well, when we come back from the break, Deb, I want to get into the the kind of and it's a funny way to say it but the concrete spiritual reality behind boredom the bible talks about acedia which is called the noonday demon mm -hmm. and we have actually encountered the actual demon of acedia in exorcisms and i want to talk about how the biblical uh version of boredom the description of boredom as a spiritual force plays out in the lives of people and how it does harm I was hoping you would share this with our Morning Joy listeners. So, Adam, let's talk about this demon of acedia. Talk about this. Tell us any of the details that we need to know. Uh, 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 trace it back to the Bible, and let's see where we can um, unpack this together. Okay. So the story, you know, in the Bible about acedia, which, which basically means sloth, uh, is also referred to as the noonday demon. The reason it's referred to as the noonday demon is the Middle East um, is a desert area and noon is an extremely hot part of the day when the sun is high and there was no air conditioning. There was some clever architecture in some of the Roman buildings that would cool things a little bit, but there was no air conditioning. And so it would be the hottest part of the day and the part that you would probably seek some shade and just stay still and you know, maybe take a nap or eat something and hide from the sun until things cooled off a little in the afternoon. So that was a reference to the noonday demon. Now, the more important and dangerous part of sloth is it touches on what we talked about in the first segment with the drugs, actually. The attack of the demon acedia is to make spiritual practices and the, the impulse to go do them fall flat. So in the possessed person who has the demon acedia in them, as they struggle to go to mass or go to adoration or read the Bible or pray the rosary, when they go to do it, they suddenly feel this wet, heavy blanket, this malaise of tired and listless and bored and uninterested and just no motivation. Just like, a, you know, oh, I can't bear to even move. It's a form of sloth and it's a disin disinterest. And so we talked about those pleasure chemicals with the drugs can get pushed very high. What acedia does is it pushes them really low. And so what would normally feel like, oh, I kind of feel good about the fact that I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to mass and I'm looking forward to a good experience there. And, you know, it, it's going to be nice and I see some people. I'm getting motivated. And my brain chemistry is coming up a little bit in terms of feeling good. Well, what acedia does is it pushes things down to almost zero. And so the person says, I feel completely listless, uninterested. They, they could be mid prayer. And in the middle of the prayer, suddenly their mind just feels like it's in molasses and they can barely even move to think the next word. And they would just struggle mightily against this and feel almost helpless to do anything. And it's kind of a, a supercharged form of sloth that only a possessed person with this demon would have. The average person wouldn't have this that bad. But it shows us how that demon operates, which is to sap the joy and the, the energy out of our spiritual practices and the thought of going to do them so much that we just kind of lose interest in God. Mm -hmm. But you're kind of describing depression. Mm-hmm. Is that... Yeah. Is it, are they linked? Well, no, because acedia is targeted on things mm -hmm. approaching God. So if the person wants to approach a sin or defiling themselves, they will feel energy and they'll feel excited about that. Mm -hmm. The demon will withdraw the suppressing of things when the person wants to approach sin. When they want to turn to God, the demon will clamp down and sap all the joy and energy out of them. Wow. 
depress depression would just be universal. I would just be depressed all day, no matter what. Gotcha, gotcha. So you've encountered this demon of acedia? Mm -hmm. Sure, in cases where people, because the part of exorcism that the public doesn't get generally is that exorcism is also a pastoral process of working with a human being. It's not just a dramatic prayer between a priest and a demon right. that lasts for 10 minutes and then it's over like in the movies. You're working with a human being who has fallen to the enemy, who is wrestling to get out of the lies of the enemy and build a life with Christ to walk a good Christian walk. It's a process of conversion and it's a pastoral process of working with a human being. It's not just about a demon and a priest. And so as we work with people between the sessions, they are trying to bring themselves to pray a little bit, to go to mass if they can tolerate it, which usually they can't, but if they're given the grace, they can do it, to go to adoration as hard as that is for them, uh, to go to confession, to, you know, if they're Catholic, avail themselves of the sacraments, to start praying, to read the Bible. They're struggling to do these things because they're trying to not only remove the demon, but build up a real Christian life. If you don't do both, you're not going to be free because Jesus wants conversion. He doesn't just want you to realize you chose the enemy, but he wants you to choose him because ultimately that's what's going to keep you safe. If you, if you, if you just say, okay, well, I won't be a Satanist anymore and I'm just going to be neutral and go live a secular life you're probably going to fall back into Satanism because you have formed that relationship. You've opened those doors. It's going to, it's going to find a way back into your life. You yeah. need to turn to God and embrace God. Right. And you've conditioned your brain to kind of go for that. It's almost like a, a, a fix, right? Mm -hmm. So they've done studies about sedentary lifestyles, you know, those that are inactive and, and don't do a lot of movement. Now, I know that there's people that are disabled or they have limitations, physical limitations, but we're meant to move and we're meant to, to just stay in that, in that inactive place can lead to the mind start, start to uh, wander and, and start thinking about all sorts of things. It's, I, I go back to this. It's important that we have a plan for the day and we have a plan for our spiritual life and we we work towards that each and every day and that involves you know some form of movement now if you can't physically get out of bed or out of out off the couch the the movement can come in the form of prayer out loud you know sing uh, praying out loud singing uh talking to someone else but don't just sit alone like that you know with your thoughts and and in that in that boredom phase because it doesn't, oh, it doesn't seem unless it's channeled to where it's it's a, a form of, you know, envisioning heaven or imagining heaven or daydreaming in that kind of way that it that is going to expand your mind. Oftentimes, it just ends up being very very destructive, and it's and it's it's a waste of time actually, and it can really be uh, hurtful for our spiritual life. Any any comments on that? Because I'm I'm a big believer that if if you can move. Get off the couch and move. Go for a walk. Go do something to to get your mind and your body going. In recent years, Deb, I have seen the basics of the rule of St. Benedict be so helpful to people that are struggling as they're going through the process of being freed, the possessed people. Ora et labora, meaning pray and work. Not just pray and sit in a room and not just work, but pray and work. Alternate the two throughout the day has been, as you would say, a game changer for a number of people that are struggling to have that spiritual conversion that they need to have towards Jesus as they're being free to the demons. Aura et labora pays great dividends because, as you say, they get moving. Those movements can be centered around the, the religious, the spiritual life also, and or they could just be exercise. They could be mm -hmm. doing something productive and moral and good. Yep. Um, but it's so important to do both. Amen to that. Okay, that'll do it for today's The Next Right Thing. We'll send it back to Keith for the rest of Morning Joy.